Bolivia, a prosecutor from La Paz, has issued arrest warrants against former de facto President Janine Añez and nine members of her government due to their links to the 2019 coup against then-President Evo Morales. Iran and Russia have extended their comprehensive cooperation agreement until March 2026, strengthening their strategic alliance. Brazil has reported a new single-day record for COVID-19 deaths as its hospitals face collapse and its ICUs are close to capacity. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, I'm Katrine Goss. In Bolivia, a prosecutor from La Paz City has issued arrest warrants against former de facto President Janine Añez and nine members of her government due to their links to the 2019 coup against then-president Evo Morales. Most of the accused are fugitives from justice. This Friday, former de facto Minister of Justice Alvaro Coimbra and former Minister of Energy Rodrigo Guzman have, over, have been arrested and will be transferred to La Paz to appear before the judge who initiated the proceedings linked to the coup. A total of 14 arrest warrants have been issued in relation to the investigation, including against former military personnel and police. The prosecutor leading the case has published a document which accuses Janine Añez of terrorism, sedition and conspiracy. In Cuba, the second stage of the phase three clinical trials of the Soberana O2 COVID-19 vaccine candidate continues. As announced by the provincial government of Havana on Twitter, the inoculation started on March 10th in 30 clinical sites of the capital and the intention is to administer shots to 44,000 people during this phase. As the authorities revealed on Friday, the trial vaccination will continue in 48 healthcare centres. Likewise, the Cuban Biotechnological and Pharmaceutical Industries Group, BioCuba Pharma, announced on Thursday that the entire Cuban population will be immunised against COVID-19 before the end of 2021, based on the proven efficacy of its vaccine candidate Soberana O2 and Abdullah. This Friday, March 12th, is the 25th anniversary of the enactment of the Helms-Burton Act, United States legislation that codifies the blockade against Cuba into law. The act was passed in 1996 under the Bill Clinton administration with the name the Cuban Liberty and Democratic Solidarity Act. However, the legislation does not promote any of those things. This illegal mechanism is contrary to international law and seeks to intensify the obstacles already imposed by the economic, commercial and financial blockade that the United States government previously imposed against the Caribbean island. Since the law was passed, the US State Department has applied measures against companies and individuals who want to trade with Cuba. The third title of the Helms-Burton Act was implemented under the Trump administration, having not been activated by any other president before him, thus extending the coercive policy against the island widely denounced by the international community. In Argentina, social organisations are undertaking a global day of action on Twitter to demand the release of social leader Milagro Sala. The global action comes five years after Salah's arrest. Through their messages, activists intend to draw attention to the arbitrary and unfair circumstances in which the social leader was arrested in 2016. In this sense, they demand an end to the political persecution against her. Salah is serving a 13-year prison sentence for the alleged misappropriation of public funds destined to the construction of housing facilities by cooperatives and social organisations. The bodies of 16 Guatemalan migrants who were murdered in January in the Mexican state of Tamaulipas have arrived in Guatemala. The Guatemalan government declared three days of mourning, while the National Council for the Assistance of Migrants handled the transfer of the bodies to their home communities. On January 22, Mexican authorities documented the discovery of about 20 burned bodies inside a scorched truck in the state on the other side of Rio Bravo in Texas. The families of the victims from San Marcos, a border city with Mexico, were the first to be notified after having alerted that they had lost contact with their relatives on January 21 and thought they were in the area where the bodies were found. A Peruvian prosecutor on Thursday charged presidential hopeful Keiko Fujimori with money laundering following a two-year investigation and said the alleged crimes merited a jail sentence of 30 years.
Fujimori is accused of receiving illegal campaign funds from Brazilian construction company Odebrecht to finance her 2011 and 2016 presidential bids. After 28 months of investigation, prosecutor Jose Perez formalized his accusation against Keiko and 40 others, including her husband, for organized crime, money laundering, obstruction of justice and false declaration in administrative proceedings. She was in pre-trial detention from October 2018 to November 2019 for the same corruption case. Ecuador's National Electoral Council has set the campaign spending limits for the two presidential candidates who will run in the second round on April 11th. The limit established for electoral campaigning through state-owned advertising agencies will be just over $1.2 million, split between both candidates, Andres Arauz, representing the Union for Hope Coalition, and Guillermo Lasso of the Centre-Right Creating Opportunities Alliance. The Electoral Council explained that the limit on the amount of money that can be spent on campaign events, such as rallies, is over $2.9 million, corresponding to 40% of the amount set for the first round. According to the electoral schedule, the campaign will begin on March 16th and end on April 8th. Ecuador's National Assembly has approved reforms to the intercultural education law, establishing a new base salary for teachers, while 26 educational institutions are once again to be run by the Army and the National Police. Our correspondent Denise Herrera brings us more details in the following report. With 126 votes in favor, the National Assembly approved the Bill on Reforms to the Intercultural Education Law. This comprehensive reform modifies about 80% of the current regulations, which have been in effect since March 2011. Different topics were discussed during the parliamentary debate. Our objective in these efforts over more than two years has been to deliver to the Ecuadorian people an inclusive education law that reflects the national reality, the necessities of the country, eliminating any aspect that represents a setback. There are schools that, due to the bad laws passed by this assembly, reduced teacher salaries but did not charge parents a penny less. It is clear that there is a distortion in the analysis of the private education system and, as always, this assembly ignores this, benefiting private schools and demeaning the majority. The reform establishes that the salary of a new teacher will be 2.5 times the unified basic salary, that is $1,000 in 2021. They will also be entitled to 30 days of uninterrupted vacation. We have made observations regarding the law and we will be proposing them. Another assembly is coming and we will see how they will benefit this structure. But we believe that the fundamental reforms are contemplated in this package and we await its implementation by the executive. The law also takes into account that 26 public educational institutions previously managed by the Army and the National Police will be once again be run by these institutions. They will have a budget granted by the state, but they will also be able to charge for tuition to cover their expenses. Former President Rafael Correa offered his opinion on the reforms, noting, what sense does it make to return to military schools managed by the armed forces? In the 21st century, power is being obeyed, not reason, and the most precious jewel is being gambled with education. Denise Herrera, Telesurquito, Ecuador. Iran and Russia have extended their comprehensive cooperation agreement until March 2026, strengthening their strategic alliance in the face of Western sanctions. The two nations agreed on a five-year extension to the agreement signed on March 12, 2001. In this context, Iran and Moscow have deepened their cooperation for mutual development. Authorities also rejected the unilateral sanctions imposed by hegemonic powers, as well as the interference of the United States in the internal affairs of nations that do not bow to its interests. The Pentagon has confirmed a series of attacks on United States troops in Iraq. A logistics convoy was hit when travelling along a road linking the cities of Basra and Nasiriyah, south of Baghdad. The attack was attributed by the US to an Iraqi group known as Saraya al-Dam. Three other units carrying US logistical equipment were also attacked in the provinces of Al-Amba, Amutana and Babylon, an operation that a newly formed group calling itself the International Resistance claimed responsibility for. 
The Pentagon confirmed that two U.S. and one British national were killed in the attacks. The U.S. continues to have troops deployed in Iraq, despite the country's parliament voting for all foreign troops to leave the country. The Lebanese capital, Beirut, saw protests this Friday over deepening poverty and political inaction, calling for an, an immediate transitional government. The country is experiencing a severe economic crisis with surging unemployment and spiralling prices, while the local currency has plunged to a new low. Since here today, as young people, is to bring that spirit back to the people, to show people that the revolution is still happening, that spirit is still here. We don't want to migrate. We, the Lebanese youth, are here and we are staying until our last breath. In the United States, Minneapolis City Council has unanimously approved a $27 million wrongful death settlement in a civil lawsuit filed by George Floyd's family against the city. The settlement is the largest pre-trial settlement in a civil rights wrongful death case in U.S. history, according to the family's lawyers, and results from a federal lawsuit filed in July 2020. Former police officer Derek Chauvin is currently on trial facing murder and manslaughter charges for Floyd's May 25, 2020 death, which was captured on video by bystanders and sparked outrage around the globe. Three other police officers also face charges linked to the killing. And a Floyd family lawyer, Ben Crump, announced the settlement and stated the family's position on the matter, noting that it represents an advance for social justice. It's my great honor to announce that George Floyd's family, our legal team, and the city of Minneapolis and its leaders have settled the civil lawsuit in the death of George Floyd. The settlement is not just historic because of the $27 million paid out, but for the impact on social justice, policy reforms, and police reforms. It is my great On Friday, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan outlined a series of measures which he said would lift the country's battered economy, pledging to bring the inflation rate back down to single digits. In an address to business leaders in Istanbul, the president also vowed to reduce public expenses and now are the current national deficit. Turkey's economy was already suffering when it was hit by the pandemic, with the local currency depreciating to record lows due to concerns over economic mismanagement, central bank reserves and tense diplomatic relations with neighbours. Annual inflation stands above 15 per cent and unemployment at around 13 per cent. We will give approximately 850,000 small businesses tax exemptions and leave their obligation to file taxes. Our economic reform package will safely carry Turkey into the future. It includes concrete and solution-oriented policies. On Friday, Pope Francis met with Portuguese President Marcelo Rebelo do Sousa. The two met at the Vatican in a private room of the papal office. According to the Portuguese presidential office, the pair discussed the Portuguese presidency of the European Union Council and the Pope's recent historic trip to Iraq. After meeting with the Pope, President Rebelo de Sousa also met with Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin. Explosions from Italy's Mount Etna sent a four-kilometre-high plume of smoke into the sky on Friday. The lava originated from the southeastern crater of Etna in the early morning and ended around noon local time. The lava flow did not threaten local villages and stopped at a 1,700-metre altitude. Etna is the largest of Italy's three active volcanoes, which also includes Stromboli and Mount Vesuvius near Naples, which last erupted in 1944. As the situation becomes more extreme in Brazil, our correspondent Brian Mir brings us more details regarding the health crisis the country has faced for the past year under the far-right Jair Bolsonaro administration. Today marks one year since the first person died in Brazil from COVID-19. After peaking at a little bit over a thousand deaths a day last August and September, there was a bit of a lull. But what happened is all of the state governments relaxed on their lockdown orders and quarantine orders. They reopened schools, they reopened bars, and they did all of this at a time when over 500 people a day were still dying in Brazil. And so during the holiday season between Christmas and Carnival, there were huge crowds 
that gathered at drinking parties and things like that on beaches and a new mutation developed in the city of Manaus that now seems to be two and a half times more contagious than other strains of the virus. Meanwhile, instead of coming up with any coherent plan, the Bolsonaro government actively encouraged people to not take the vaccine. And even now, the president is still doing Facebook Lives telling people not to wear masks. And the result of this all is that when responsible mayors and governors try to implement lockdown orders to respond to this new wave, which is now hitting Brazil harder than any other time in its history, with the public hospital systems in three of Brazil's five regions in collapse with no more ICU units. Gangs of Bolsonaro supporters are threatening local officials who try to implement lockdown orders. In the last seven days, 1,700 people have died a day on average. There's no end in sight to the dilemma faced by the Brazilian people in the irresponsible Bolsonaro government and the mutations that are developing here in Manaus and now a new one in Rio de Janeiro spreading around the world. And this is why Nicolas Maduro, the democratically elected president of Venezuela, called on the United Nations to intervene in Brazil. Thank you, Brian. And we continue in Brazil, where the federal health regulator has approved the AstraZeneca Oxford COVID-19 vaccine for widespread use, as well as the antiviral medication Remdesivir, the first drug for patients hospitalized with the virus, after the country reported a new single-day record of COVID-19 deaths. The benefits outweigh the risks, and the data support the registration of the product AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. We don't currently see any risk to the population's health related to the use of this vaccine, and therefore our recommendation is to do proceed with registration. The World Health Organization said Friday it was assessing reports of blood coagulation disorders faced by some people who were inoculated with a specific batch of the AstraZeneca vaccine distributed in the European Union, while stressing that the shots are safe to use. They are looking at the, these particular um, signals and will uh, meeting every meeting soon and will advise WHO on any new safety signals or concerns about any vaccines and they're currently assessing the reports on AstraZeneca and as soon as we've got a full understanding of that from our committee we will um, communicate that with, to the public. Um, vaccination against uh, COVID-19 doesn't reduce deaths from any other causes Thromboembolic events do happen in the population, so uh, it's not clear whether this is something that was going to happen or whether there was any relationship. That's why it's important to have always review any signal like this. And also on Friday, the World Health Organization announced it had granted an emergency use listing for the coronavirus vaccine made by Johnson & Johnson. That this new vaccine will help to narrow vaccine inequalities and not deepen them. The COVAX facility has booked 500 million doses of the J&J &J vaccine and we look forward to receiving them as soon as possible. An equitable distribution of vaccines remains the biggest threat to ending the pandemic and driving a global recovery. As I said last week, one of the major challenges we need to solve is how to dramatically increase production of vaccines. Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz on Friday defended his country's decision to temporarily stop using one batch of the AstraZeneca vaccine. For me, it is important to say that we never make the decisions for political reasons, but that decisions are made based on the experts. Anytime if there is a suspicion or if there is a death that occurs not long after vaccination, then it has to be very carefully investigated, of course. And the Austrian Chancellor also criticised the vaccine delivery strategy of the European Union. Deliveries are not made according to population key. There are indications that this practice will intensify in the coming months and that the differences between the member states will become greater and greater. These delivery plans clearly contradict the political goal of the European Union, namely that all member states should receive their share per capita equally. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.